We will try to re-establish contact with Carmen as soon as possible. It would seem that she has once again somehow stumbled onto something beyond anyone's understanding, and we're already in contact with authorities to request investigation of the skies in the vicinity of Carmen's last communication. And Jessica, it is of interest to note that the last location identified for Carmen's personal embedded comm was several kilometers from what we believe to be where she disappeared. Wherever she is now, her locator system is being blocked or jammed, and was for some time compromised before we lost contact. Vlad, I have to believe that all of this, starting from the Luxair event right up to Carmen's dropping out of contact, is not only related but almost certainly part of the same phenomenon, and our often foolhardy but miraculously serendipitous Carmen is as usual caught up directly in the unfolding mystery. A mystery, I need hardly add, that's on a scale we may never have observed before on this planet. We know that if there's a way to get to the heart of what's really going on, very likely the same thing that's behind the sudden global crisis, it'll be Carmen Electra that manages to do it. Carmen, we at WRAT have learned to trust your instincts, no matter how bizarre the path they lead you on, and we'll look forward with great anticipation to your next report. Carmen, that goes for all of us. And you can expect me to give you my usual lecture about trying not to scare your colleagues half to death with worry every time you go out on an assignment. With you, nothing turns out to be simple. And Vlad, although she's fighting a more tangible threat than whatever Carmen's facing, Melanie Ross is up to her neck in danger as she takes on riot management at the North Terminus Lifestyle Center. Melanie, I hope you have some good news for us. Alison, I've managed to create a sort of buffer zone around the subway access hub where it seems four unhappy citizens have taken it upon themselves to prevent all access to the underground transit pathways. It's possible they have accomplices below ground as well, since they appear totally focused on keeping anyone up here from descending, and nobody's come up the ascender ramps since I got here. You think this is totally localized, or are these maniacs possibly a part of something more organized? If you haven't had reports of subway blockades in other areas of the network, it's probably just a few restless citizens who've lost it as a result of the freak events. For now, we're managing by keeping everyone in the complex back behind buildings and structures, because the moment anyone shows so much as a shoulder to these people, they open fire. I'm just waiting to see if there are any official SSF in the building before I move in and pacify them. I know you still carry that neural whip you specialized in when you were on the live fire circuit, Melanie. But don't you think in this crisis it would be better to just let the authorities handle the situation? No point in putting yourself at risk unnecessarily. That's exactly what I mean, Alison. As I said before, I'm not sure we have any threat management personnel on hand. The local security guards are just not trained for this kind of violent outburst. And they're more than overwhelmed already with trying to manage the chaos in the main leisure park area following the lightning strikes and that horrific explosion of the power management hub. And the fire crews have their hands full already with emergency care. It may be that I have no choice but to, as you say, put myself at risk to prevent further injury to the public. Listen, I know you've managed these kinds of situations before, but do be careful. You can't help those terrified and injured citizens if you're hurt yourself. Learned that lesson only too well, Alison. I went... Shit, they just took down a young girl who wandered around the edge of a building. Alison, I can't wait any longer. I'm going to take these maniacs out my way. First stand a capture in place, and... I'm inbound. I know. Well, if those truly are just citizens who've lost it in the current crisis, they'll not know what hit them. Apart from her military training, Melanie was one of the most effective sweepers on the live fire circuit during the nine years she played with Exactor. Not to mention her unparalleled skill in low gravity from all those home matches played at Space Hub. A formidable force is our Melanie. And Ellison, I have never seen anyone wield a nerve whip from range like Melanie. 30 meters or more. Just as well she has SSF license for it. Not a weapon for the general public. Located in our hidden warrens far beneath the city. WRAT squad of intrepid reporters infest the city, unseen and unlooked for. Combined with the magic of video, 
We are the eyes and ears of this metropolis, and we're here 24 365 for you. I know Melanie will make the right judgment call when it comes to direct attacks on citizens. That's why she has the authority to use such weapons in the first place. But WRAT traffic reporter Haley Klassen in Hoverjet 4 has no such training. Only a standard emergency first responder field course and two years of harrowing service as a paramedic pilot. Seems that she is now dealing with the kind of nightmare situation that even Melanie might have trouble managing. Haley, tell us what's going on. Near, near the top of Canada Tower, Jessica. Trying to make a kind of bridge between a small mass of stranded hovers and the upper observation deck on the tower. What are you doing? Ah. Jesus. Holy shit. Oh, God. Ah. I'm not sure I get the picture, Haley. What exactly are you doing? Holy shit. You okay, lady? Oh. That was some stunt. Oh, Drop through the hard buffer below the hovers. Using the Kevlar rope and hover jet force emergency pack. I'm standing on the observation platform now, about 10 meters below where the hovers and their passengers are stranded. Okay, it's secure. Should be able to get them down now. Got a brief security guard here to assist. And we're going to try and help these people get to safety. Those who survived the initial accidents, at least. Have you ever climbed one of those ropes before, Haley? It's not easy at the best of times. But a hundred meters in the air, trying to swing down to a tower ten meters below is not your average activity. Best not to think about it, Jessica. If I just do it, and stay focused, it seems to come naturally. I guess all those years of weight training helps. At least I'm not having the same issues with the altitude as those poor passengers up there. You're not really going back up there now, are you? Jessica, I'm going to climb up this rope again now. My friend here has a kind of harness we can strap people into and let them drop down slowly with the rope as I guide. But it needs someone to operate it. As it happens, I've used one before in a rescue we did a couple of years back. Probably not so easy to talk as I climb, oh, shit. so I'll check back in once this rescue is into phase three. Thank our beloved Rick Allen for his insistence on only the best for us traffic pilots. Hoverjet 4 has already proven its worth several times today. Haley, <coughs> out! Do you ever need to be able to shut out the madness of the world around you? Focus only on the task at hand and prevent the general chaos of your surroundings from consuming all your attention? Ever felt helpless in the face of all-consuming panic at the number of worries and fears that grip you and fill your every waking thought? We know you have. Like millions of others, you need the clarity of mind, the purity of vision, and discriminatory perception that only Everclear can give you. Maintain your focus on a single task or objective regardless of the frantic activity that envelops those around you. Shut out those interfering unnecessary thoughts. Steal your mind and bring peace to help you concentrate on the moment. Everclear can take you to that place. For those times when chaos reigns, there's Everclear. By mon dieu. Everclear should only be taken after consultation with a physician. Side effects may occur. Please read all labels carefully before use. This is WRAT AM 1700, The Rat. It's 8.30 in Sewerston on this Wednesday, September 10th, 2098. I'm Alison Forsyth. And here's what's making news at this hour. And I am Vladimir Tinnikov. If you are just joining us from wherever you are, welcome to live coverage of the latest crisis that our city and probably our entire planet is facing. The weather and the atmosphere seem to be conspiring to create devastating and unpredictable events around the globe. And so far, we have no real idea what is causing them, or what we can do to stop them. I'm Jessica Henderson. There are specific disaster zones all across Sewerston at this hour. Several of our WRH reporters are on scene at the sites of these events, and we will continue to bring you updates on developments as they happen. But it is important to remind everyone listening that you should get to a secure, sealed, safe environment as soon as you can, 
Stay there, and wait for an all-clear before venturing out again. This is not to be taken lightly. Your life may depend on your taking action immediately. And if you're in the skies, do not wait for a major intersection. Get down to the nearest ramp now and land. Your vehicle could lose all power at any moment. As Jessica said, we don't know much at this point about what exactly is behind this rather sudden series of catastrophic atmospheric events. But our meteorologist David Burrell has already speculated on possible causes, and he now has a new set of thoughts that may pertain to the current crisis. David, what have you come up with? For myself, Allison, I still believe from a meteorological standpoint that we have destabilized the tropopause, the boundary that exists between our atmosphere and the stratosphere, and until we can find a way to re-establish it, we should expect these unpredictable weather-related phenomena to become increasingly more severe and more frequent as well. At the moment, it is clear that nobody has any idea how to reverse the destabilization process that we as a species have been busily engineering for the past 200 or so years. Or even if it is possible to effect such a reversal in a time frame that will allow us to meaningfully weather this crisis. In other words, soon enough that the atmosphere which sustains us can be maintained in a habitable state. Worst case scenario, Allison. This could indeed, and quite literally, be the last gasp for humankind. <clears throat> David, that is a very difficult thing to hear, especially coming from someone so eternally optimistic as you. I know you've thought about this. Can you tell us what you think put us in this situation? And what in God's name might we do to get out of it? As to how we got here, Allison, I have already alluded to it a few times, but rather than trying to paraphrase, I will let you hear it directly from one of the world's leading atmospheric specialists, Erica Balak. She has been in private conference with our bureau chief and his global team for the past hour and has agreed to speak to us live for a few minutes before getting back to join her staff in analyzing the specifics of what is happening. Erica, are you there? Hi, David. I can't spend too much time on this call, as I'm needed at the Monitoring and Simulation Centre. But I can assure Suiston listeners that the main causes of this crisis are indeed man-made, and stem from our failure to effectively manage our world population. We've made great strides in controlling pollution and emissions on a per capita basis over the last century, and if we'd also maintained the world's population at a balanced level, our atmosphere, well, it would have been much better shape. But our population for various reasons, including improved control of a disease, better food production and distribution, incredible standard of living rebalancing across all nations, coupled with cultural traditions and religious practices, has now truly reached unmanageable proportions. To the point where even the latest food production and water purification methods cannot keep pace. We are now at a population doubling every 10 years. At 200 billion people, our current estimated total, CO2 production, even with best practices, is killing our planet from the atmosphere in. The ocean's capacity to act as a buffer, absorbing and slowly re-emitting, has been exceeded. The levels of carbon dioxide in our upper atmosphere have compromised the jet stream and other major air circulation redistribution flows, to the point where carbon dioxide levels in the tropopause and stratosphere have risen dangerously high. In effect, the tropopause is no more. And the stratosphere, now mixing almost freely with the troposphere, where we live, is not a place we can survive in. I will let David explain the rest. Thank you for your very direct and very honest words, Erica. As to the rest, it has long been asserted by certain countries that enforced population control was needed worldwide not just in what were perceived in democratic countries to be the totalitarian regimes. It seems that the more restrictive societies have had it right all along. We may have no other choice in future, assuming we weather the current crisis. And to add to this, proposals have recently come forward as to enforced obsolescence in the population, a maximum lifespan, if you will, to further reduce our now unmanageable numbers. This, too, may come to pass if we survive long enough. But for the immediate shorter term, I think I can speak for the Bureau team at this moment. We do not yet have a feasible strategy or any workable recommendation that will defuse this crisis. Whatever we do, it needs to be drastic and it needs to happen soon. 
I know that the Bureau will communicate any concrete, practical suggestions once they have developed an approach they think will be effective. I am afraid we cannot dispute the conclusions of either the Bureau or our own meteorological staff, nor their credentials. But it is, of course, my sincerest hope that we do find a way to restore the balance, at least to the extent needed to sustain us through this crisis. And as we struggle to cope with the implications of what is happening around our megalopolis and globally, we turn for distraction as people have for thousands of years to sports. And in this case, I know Tasha Mayfield and her team can supply enough distraction to get us fully energized in a positive way tonight. Tasha. You bet. We all need any distraction we can find tonight, Vlad. And have we got it for you. I'll hand it over to Lena Smith at the Warren, where our invaders are mangling the Triple S. Lena, give us the news. You got it right, Flash. Total annihilation Suicide style. And Socket is a blur out there as she threads the Shanghai defense time and time again. The invaders are a well-oiled machine. Chick Caber and his midfield crew of Lee Falcon and Birdman Green setting up an impenetrable wall in front of their defensive line, nailing anything that moves, winning every encounter or loose ball, and using every conceivable arena surface to rattle that elusive orb forward with the socket on her wingers. And once it's there, it's in the goal. From winger to center, center to winger, off the roof, the back wall, direct pass, a whirlwind of movement that leaves Shanghai's captain too dizzy to keep up. Next thing he knows, he's picking that ball out of his goal again, and they're resetting for the next point. And he never even saw it coming. Our odious invaders must be drawing energy directly from the chaos going on in all parts of the city then, Lena, and using it to fuel their play. They've been playing for half an hour or so, which usually will take the score up into the five or six goal range. What's the tally so far? Flash, Trigger Trizos just squeezed past the Birdman and takes a neat crossfield ball from Super Bowl Chang, sidesteps Chip Caver's assault, leaving the invaders back line for the first time in the match, and slam! He's flattened by D-Bell so fast with such smooth precision that the ball is already rattling off the left wall into Blaster's outstretched hand, sideways flip to socket, and in the back of the scourge goal, again, again, again! 20 to nothing, not yet at the half. The biggest lopsided blow at speedball history, and the Triple S are really as a team just as much as the stunned Trigger Trizzo. Staggering to her feet now after d skull rattling hit, seeing stars all around them, and their names are the Arbius Invaders! Don't ever tell me the power of belief, the psychological state of a team, the sheer confidence they take into a game cannot dictate the outcome. The invaders believe in their own legend just as much as the Scourge fear it, and we are witnessing the outcome. A team with a solid winning record coming into this quarterfinal, humbled into total submission by a team whose morale seems to know no bounds. And as Lena frosts at the mouth over at the Warren, trying to keep it together along with the fans, I know there is a once-in-a-lifetime contest rattling the rafters at the underworld heap as well. Ghost Fabian is taking it all in and maybe absorbing a lifetime dose of electric energy in the process. Ghost, are you still with us? This is decidedly not a one-sided blow, Tasha, but probably the most intense star-studded life bar match I have ever witnessed, either as player or as reporter. Without its two superstars, this would be a neck-and-neck, nail-biting conflict, but with Banshee and Cat both dancing the magic dance, each in their own unique way, and their teams rising to the occasion. It is a match of moments. Unparalleled brilliance, team coordination, pattern weaving, and sheer artistry. Not terms I would ever think to use in describing life art, but this is no ordinary event, and all of us here at the Underworld Heat are, as you suggest, soaking up the energy like we're basking in full solar glare. I know both Cat and Banshee have left their earlier unfrag tags behind them in this contest, Ghost. But how are they faring in the more open, less strategic format? I hate to say cat and mouse, but have they really thrown all that out the window tonight? Not at all, Tasha. Both team captains are as elusive as they can be, and as we'd expect to see them. But the sheer brilliance of their team management, coordinated attack and defensive plans, and electrifying efficiency means that each team is finding openings no other team will ever be able to achieve under normal leadership. The slam count has risen to 12 for our tail thrashers and 8 for the double O. The score standing at 80 to 62 for the hometown squad. 
The Oblivion have already crept within 10 twice, and it has only been Banshee's creativity and individual skill that has kept the gap from closing. Speaking of which, she has just closed a trap on the double O using her own sweepers as bait, and felling all the cat in a precision solo assault. Wait, the cat has emerged from concealment and reversed the assault, a trap within a trap, and she's taken out all the Banshee and Outfire, who seem prepared for the secondary ambush. They dropped out of sight in two different directions, everyone else out for the 10 second frag count, and... All fire tackles Cat from the side, and Cat spins through and fires, dropping her opponent in one smooth motion, but turns too slow. The fancy sweeps in from behind the double captain and fails her. Another slam for the thrashers. Just under the wire as the rest of the double O get back into the fight and regroup around Cat. Awesome action. Simply awesome. Thanks for letting all that joy and passion flow out over the waves, Ghost. Suiston will appreciate and savor every moment they can tonight. You got me drooling, buddy. Wishing I was there. Enjoy. Vlad, I think that's enough distraction for the moment. We'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Tasha. It is indeed exciting to hear what is happening in these two matches tonight, and I agree that these reports will be sure to raise the spirits of the people of Suiston. We will eagerly await the next update from these matches.